Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And a warm welcome to you all to this uh, sixth Ignat Thakur Memorial Lecture, a tribute to Ignat Ji Thakur's monumental contribution to Saraswat Bank. Today's topic is the future of banking. And to deliver this lecture, we are privileged to have distinguished speaker and eminent economist, Dr. Ajit Ranade. Give him a big hand, please. <clears throat> Dr. Ajit Ranade is Vice Chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune. He was earlier Group Executive President and Chief Economist with the Aditya Birla Group. Dr. Ranade is a member of Executive Committees of Apex Industry Chambers like CII and FICI. He is the Chairman of the Research Advisory Committee of IIBF, member of the BCSBI, and was a member of RBI's Tarapur Committee on Capital Account Convertibility. He was also Chief Economist and Head of Microfinance of Avian Amro Bank. He is a co-author of an award-winning book, Rising to the China Challenge, which was published in 2021. Before we uh, proceed further, may I request Chairman Sri Gautam Thakur, Vice Chairman Sri Shashikan Sakakar, and our senior most director, Padma Shri Madhu Mangesh Karnikji, to welcome our distinguished speaker, Dr. Ajit Ranadiji. <laughs> Dr. Ranade. Dr. Ranade is a co-founder and trustee of Association of Democratic Reforms, a citizen watchdog body. He is a trustee of Pune International Center. <laughs> and an honorary senior fellow at the Takshashila Institution. Dr. Ranade holds a B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Bombay. and is an alumnus of IIM Ahmedabad. He received his PhD in economics from Brown University. Uh, may I now uh, request Sri Gautam sir to spare his thoughts on this occasion. Respected Dr. Ajit Ranade, our senior most director, Padma Shri Madhu Mangesh Karnikji, Vice Chairman Shri Shashikan Sakarkar, members of the Board of Directors and Board of Management, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to see you all gathered here today to hear Dr. Ranade, one of the finest and foremost learned minds in the field of economics. It has been our endeavor to make the Eknath Thakur Memorial Lecture a forum of fresh ideation and new light by inviting eminent speakers from diverse fields. The first lecture of this series was delivered by Sarasanga Chalak Shri Mohan Bhagwat. The second by Srimati Arundhati Bhattacharya, former chairperson of State Bank of India. The third by Sri Satish Marathe, Central Board Director, Reserve Bank of India. The fourth by Sri Kumar Ketkar, MP and veteran journalist. The fifth by Sri Girish Kuber Sahib, editor Lok Satta and an expert in the field of energy. And the sixth will be shortly delivered by the erudite and eminent economist, Dr. Ranade. The previous five lectures were uh, delivered at Savarkar Sabagro on 15th of February, the birth anniversary of Sri Eknath Thakur every year. This lecture had to be rescheduled on the 14th since Dr. Ranade had an urgent meeting to advise the CM and Deputy CM of Maharashtra on important economic matters. Savarkar Sabagra was not available, so this uh, uh, lecture is being conducted at the Nehru Center. I believe that the size of the hall no longer matters in today's world, since the last lecture of Sri Girish Kuber Sahib has garnered 19,000 views on YouTube. I am sure that Dr. Ranade's lecture will also be received with equal enthusiasm. On a lighter note, we have traversed very easily between Savarkar and Nehru 
but our policy politicians don't seem to get it. Uh, I'm sorry. Thakur Sahib rose from humble roots to leave an indelible impression on whatever he undertook to achieve in life. In society as a great supporter of noble social and cultural projects. In politics as a widely respected and studied parliamentarian, always raising issues of the underprivileged. In banking as a fiery trade union unionist and later in life as the legendary chairman of Saraswat Bank, who led the bank to previously unheard of heights in the cooperative banking sector. Under his leadership, the bank's total business grew from 3,500 crores to about 38,000 crores. I am happy to inform you that in this year, Saraswat Bank will cross a significant milestone of 75,000 crore rupees. And that too with a net NPA of less than half percent and provision coverage ratio of more than 90 percent. As you can very well see, our board and employees at all levels have carried forward this rich legacy of sterling leadership in the cooperative sector. It was only befitting that the board decided to start this Eknath Thakur Memorial Lecture Series in his memory uh, for his monumental contribution to Saraswat Bank. A unique feature of Thakur Sahib's leadership was his rare ability to mentor people according to their inherent skills to ensure flourishing up to their full potential. I am sure many of you present here today must have experienced it in your interactions with him. For all of us in the family, he had inculcated the reading habit and his formula for mentorship towards us was very simple, read. Uh, while I was studying engineering in Pune, whenever I came home, he would ask me only one question. What are you reading nowadays, apart from your syllabus? This was the time in late 80s, sir, uh, when neoliberalism had just set in. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan were on the world stage. India also was turning its back on socialism and moving in the direction of cap capitalism and the pursuit of individual prosperity. Greatly impressed at an impressionable age, greatly impressed and enamored by this worldview, I would enthusiastically talk to Thakur Sahib about Ayn Rand, Robert Nozick and others. He would listen patiently, arguing uh, without arguing and perhaps to moderate and temper my outlook, he suggested that I should find time to read at the library of Gokhale Institute uh, of Politics and Economics, a place he also frequented during his college years in Pune, in his never-ending quest uh, for knowledge. By this time, Marxism had been associated with the failure of communism in Soviet Russia. And soon Marxism turned into a word not to be uttered in politics. Thakur Sahib had no problem with capitalism. In fact, he appreciated its ability to effectively use capital to generate a surplus. But coming from a humble rural background, he was keenly aware of the problem in economics of the distribution of the surplus. And perhaps that is why he was trying to shape my thinking by encouraging me to read at the Gokhale Institute the view, views of John Rawls, Marx, and which were polar opposites of what I was reading then. In fact, when I met Dr. Ranade, I told him about this background as how it has influenced uh, the, our thinking. Uh, not one to have a lopsided view in terms of uh, capitalist or socialist, Thakur Sahib firmly believed in the cooperation movement, which was a sangam of both ideas. Uh, capitalism provides the efficiency and the surpluses. Socialism takes care of the distribution of these surpluses. IFCO, Amul, and Saraswat Bank are the greatest examples of the success of this Sangam. Thakur Sahib was keenly aware that a cooperative institution 
in order to succeed would require committed leadership which would not succumb to politics, power, or patronage. And that is how he shaped our board. Uh, friends, Dr. Ajit Ranade is carrying forward the rich legacy of Gokhale Institute of a worldview that is unbiased and open to all ideas leading to human flourishment. Dr. Ranade is a erudite scholar, respected author, ideator, speaker, whose voice rings with truth and the conviction of his beliefs. He is respected by so many of us for his writings, which enrich us with an entirely new and fresh perspective. His ideas are not only shaped by his academic brilliance, but also honed by facing broader issues in the world of business with his stints as chief economist of the Aditya Birla Group and many other corporate and banking assignments and experiences at the board level. Dr. Anade is a rare economist who speaks in the language and idiom of the common man. Unlike other economists who seem to be speaking in a language which could be called economies like Chinese or Vietnamese or economish like English or Polish. So he doesn't speak these languages, he, he, he speaks very plainly. I read his articles and listen to his lectures often on YouTube. Let me give you a few examples of how effortlessly he conveys his ideas. To explain the concept of GDP, he asks his uh, readers and viewers to imagine the economy as a huge black box in which the inputs are, I'm quoting you, sir, <laughs> the inputs are capital, labor, by labor he also means skills and demographics, and of course, innovation. And the output is GDP. The quality and quantity of output depends on the quality and quantity of these three inputs. That is the capital, labor, and innovation. In, in labor, of course, it is uh, the skills as well as the demography. And that is how he has projected that 7.5% is a standard rate of growth which India should naturally achieve in every particular year. Another example, to explain the complex idea of inequality, uh, he, he asks us to imagine pollution. Dr. Ranade No economist will talk like this. So he says, inequality is like pollution. It will always be around, but it depends on each society as to how much of it should be tolerated. He doesn't use complex terms like Gini coefficient or whatever. And I don't think there is any other economist anywhere in the world who can put such ideas in such simple words. The problem with most politicians is they have little patience to understand economics. In fact, one American president had famously said, please bring to me an economic advisor with one hand, because my previous adv advisor always said, on the other hand. <laughs> with his plain speaking and straightforward opinions, I am sure our political leadership has much to benefit from Dr. Ranade's advice. Dr. Ranade's lecture today will be on the subject of future of banking. Many of you are bankers here. Walter Bejhot, the uh, renowned editor of The Economist, had said way back in 1873, the distinctive function of a banker begins as soon as he uses the money of others. Distinctive feature of a banker begins as soon as he uses the money of others. When he uses his own money or borrows money for business, he is a mere capitalist. Since the last 200 years, banks have been using these short-term deposits from the general public, converting them into relatively long-term assets or loans. 
while also being the vehicle of monetary policy. Today, we stand at strange crossroads of traditional banking, technology, and regulation. Technology is disrupting banking for good, like it has disrupted all other uh, industries. And regulation is trying to keep pace with this change. In the not so distant future, with digital currencies, abundant artificial intelligence, the question arises whether there will be a need for banks, and if so, what will they be like? To answer questions like these about the future of, future of banking in his lucid style, I invite Dr. Anade to deliver his lecture, which all of you are eagerly waiting for. Dr. Anade. Good evening and uh, namaskar to all of you. Uh, I would first of all, of course, uh, Mr. Vaidya did a very generous introduction, so, and followed by Mr. Thakur, Gautam Thakur's very, very generous and warm and loving uh, introduction, so thank you very much. So, Chairman Mr. Thakur, uh, Shri Madhubangesh Karnik, uh, Shri Thakurkar, uh, and dignitaries in, in the audience and friends, thank you for inviting me to deliver this uh, sixth uh, memorial lecture in memory of uh, Shri Eknaji Thakur, Mrs. I'm very happy to learn that you and your husband have been uh, SBI probationers, uh, which is, according to, in my mind, uh, elite cadre only next to IAS, but in a much nicer way. <laughs> but, because I have had the uh, good fortune and privilege of interacting with many uh, people who uh, have been SBI officers of that, what they call SBI probationers. And, uh, Almost all of them have gone on to lead uh, really fantastic careers and achievements, mostly in banking, but even outside banking. So I'm very happy to learn that Sri Eknath Ji Thakur, apart from all the other things that he achieved, was in my mind, uh, SBI is a high point. <laughs> so uh, the, before I go into the topic, uh, I was struck by what Mr. Thakur said, Manje Gautam, Gautam Ji. He, uh, his father used to ask him, Ki, what are you reading? I don't know, I think it's attributed to Dr. Ambedkar, but maybe many other people have said, Ki, vachal tar vachal. I'm sure this is a very popular slogan. So those of you who don't know Marathi, it is a play on the word reading. Vachal tar vachal. If you read, you will survive. If you read, in fact, you will thrive. If you read, you will flourish. So, um, Somebody was saying, you know, there is a device which uh, doesn't uh, need uh, uh, battery recharge, uh, no subscription, no updates, and it's the old-fashioned book. So uh, I'm really struck by the fact that it is a, it's a timeless uh, advice, I think, that your father gave you. I'm very happy to also report to all of you that uh, Gokhale Institute has possibly one of the three finest libraries in the country. Uh, with more than three and a half lakh documents. And uh, the oldest document is from 1681, just one year after Shivaji Maharaj died. So uh, if you have the opportunity to come to Pune, it's a public library. It doesn't belong only to Gokhale Institute. It belongs to the people of India, certainly people of Pune or Maharashtra. And uh, as, he, uh, as he himself uh, admitted, he has spent uh, many fruitful days and weeks, perhaps, uh, browsing through the books. And you will be surprised to discover some really old and uh, precious books. Of course, we are trying to modernize, just like Saraswat Bank is uh, on a modern journey. So we are trying to do a digital transformation. Uh, I also wanted to mention, uh, by the way, before we begin, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, uh, the bank, Saraswat Bank, because uh, I am told that in the last three years, uh, the global magazine Forbes, when they did the survey of banks, uh, Saraswat Bank has, for the three years in a row, uh, featured among the top ten banks in India. So please give a warm applause. <laughs> <laughs> At uh, 75,000 crores, I would like to think of this as the really true beginning of Amrit Kal for Saraswat Bank. <laughs> So uh, really congratulations, and uh, it's a fantastic achievement. And 
uh, especially because they are a cooperative bank. So I'll say a few things about uh, cooperative banks maybe a little later. As you know, actually, maybe this is the right time to mention it, that globally, the concept of co cooperative bank or cooperate or they, what they call credit union is a widespread phenomenon. And it is a respected, respectable name and a respectable business. In fact, I am told that there are almost one lakh uh, cooperative banks or credit unions in the world, and which, with more than a quarter billion people uh, who are members of credit unions. They are called members. You know, they, you call, don't call them depositors, or you don't call them borrowers, you call them members, because they are cooperatives. Uh, and uh, globally, uh, the, the credit unions that is the term used uh, internationally, they manage assets worth $2.2 trillion, almost the size of India's GDP. So that is the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of uh, impact or spread. In fact, uh, the largest countries where, uh, the, where cooperative unions or, credit, uh, or cooperative banks or credit unions exist, among them, the, the largest such presence is in USA, America, and India and of course Brazil and, and Canada and so on. So it is a fantastic thing and uh, I'm very happy to see that uh, not only is the bank, your bank doing so well, but it is also featured among the top performing banks in the country. So it's a, it's a spectacular achievement and I hope not only you will continue on this journey, but you will inspire other credit uh, unions and cooperative banks to emulate your actions and also that this philosophy spreads beyond uh, banking. As you said, you took the name of IFCO and uh, AMUL, but uh, they should not be examples by uh, isolation or in, in exception, they should become the rule. So whether it is milk or whether it is fertilizers, whether it is retail stores, Sarkari, Bhandar, this, this spirit of uh, uh, cooperation or cooperatives, the movement is very, very important according to me. And uh, your success is, uh, you don't need any theory. <laughs> you just, your success is the biggest proof. So do, you don't need of any complicated theories, your Ayn Rand or whatever you are saying. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that is one. So the other uh, little tidbit I'd like to mention is that uh, uh, just an anecdote I wanted to uh, share. So a friend of mine, uh, she is uh, what they call uh, Bioethicist. I don't know if you know this word. Basically, all the pharma companies and drug companies, uh, you know, they develop the drugs and medicines by doing, there are stage one, stage two, stage three. Then there is something called clinical trials, which have to be actually done on human beings. So typically, a lot of the big pharma companies in the world, especially Western companies, they go to developing countries and they do the clinical trials because I think it is cheaper or because clinical trials have to be, uh, there's a very elaborate protocol and they have to be administered and so it is cheaper. So from a cost perspective, so this is a story where this drug company, so and, and they need to have bioethicists on their panel because the ethics committee has to clear this. It's, an, it's a mandatory requirement, legal requirement. The ethics uh, is about have you explained the all the implications of the drug trial to the to the individual, that they are participating voluntarily, there is no coercion, they are fully informed, etc., etc. So the interesting <laughs> incident uh, I was told is that uh, the clinic, this was in Cambodia, Kampuchea, a country which is, uh, you may know about it, it is in uh, East Asia, it's a uh, neighboring of Laos and Thailand and Myanmar, it's a small country. Uh, so the, after the trial is over, the person is given a check because for participation you are also given a fee. So the person is comes to the whatever that uh, center and they, then they hand over a check uh, to the this person. So he looks at it. What is this? This is a check. No, uh, you are going to pay me, no? Yeah, yeah, this is a check. So what happens to this? You have to go and deposit it in your account. What is that? I mean, so, and this is not a very old story, okay? Uh, this is not from 1800. <laughs> this is a sto contemporary story. 
So this person, who may have been from a slightly backward region or a tribal community, they had no clue that money actually can be uh, in a piece of paper which has to be gone and, gone and shown to a, some other office. And you know, the, so this was quite remarkable and a, I would say almost shocking uh, story to me. I, I was, that this is something that even today, in today's world, there are people out there, and not just in remote and tribal parts of India, all over the world, where banking has not reached the concept. We think that we have internet and WhatsApp, but actually there are parts of the world, maybe quite a bit. And the more alien concept is that, you know, where is my money? It's not here, it's in some office. And maybe it's not there, because there is no... You know, otherwise I would go every day to my bank branch and say, please open the locker, please open the... Let me see if it's there. It's only some accounting entries in a computer. So I, I wanted to relate this little, uh, it might be a very trivial uh, epi uh, anecdote, but actually it shows how much the whole thing works on. It works on trust, it works on belief, it works on confidence, ki somebody is holding some money on my behalf, and whenever I need it, I'll get it. This is the, this is the story of banking. Okay, that uh, we have this so, we, are, we, we can sleep well that night, that all this hard-earned money and savings Somebody is holding it for me, and whenever I need it, I'll get it. I know all of you are very sophisticated bankers and practitioners, so far this is somewhat alien even, but I'm telling you, this is a story which I heard very recently. Uh, so this is, the, this is what you need to understand. I think, remember, when you talk about future bank, of banking, that it's, it's a foundation of trust. The other thing I wanted to mention in terms of future of banking, uh, because I'll just jump to another an anecdote, but this is not really an anecdote, it's a little cartoon I saw, 30 years ago. I didn't see this cartoon now. I saw this cartoon 30 years ago. So the cartoon has this uh, lady, the wife of the house, and she has this, you know, the husband is also there, and she has all these curlers and all that. <laughs> she says, um, honey, can you please answer the television? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the phone. Let me repeat. <laughs> Honey, can you please answer the television? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the phone. Now this, in today's world, unfortunately, it has lost a little bit of the edge. You see, uh, the standard thing, American, you know, household. I'm, see, honey, I'm watching t the TV program. Can you please answer the phone? The phone is ringing. So this cartoon was, honey, can you answer the TV? I'm watching the phone. But today, of course, in today's world, you're, we all watch TV on this only. So I know that this, uh, it's already a reality. But this is from 30 years ago, when this is the future. So when I say that when you, uh, somebody had the, uh, had the good sense or the insight to produce a cartoon, this was just a little cartoon in some magazine. Honey, can, can you please uh, answer the TV for me? I'm watching the phone. But this was 30 years ago. Somebody, so today we need to do that. When you talk about future of banking, yeah, you need to um, think about uh, what will it look at uh, from, uh, let's say, 20, 30, 40 years from now. So today we have to, somebody from you or us has to draw a cartoon and say, uh, what is it going to be? So on, the, on that count, I just want to uh, spend two, three minutes on this uh, finance versus economic development and then come to uh, the trends. So there was a very famous economist from Cambridge, uh, UK. Uh, her name is Joan Robinson. In fact, she used to regularly come to India. She used to come to Mumbai. She used to come to Kerala. And she uh, made a very uh, famous statement that uh, banking, uh, finance, or rather banking, is the handmaiden of economic development. That means uh, finance follows enterprise. Where there is enterprise, financial services will follow. In simple words, when there is economic activity, when there is some in, in entrepreneurship, when there is some uh, commerce, sooner or later a bank branch will show up. Now, a good example of this is Dharavi. The first branch of Dharavi, I think, came out, if I'm not mistaken, only 20 years ago. I don't think a uh, uh, any commercial bank, I don't know if Saraswat Bank has a branch in Dharavi. So now you do. But I remember, I yes, 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 yes. So I, <laughs> I, I think I'm right that. But Dharavi economic activity has pre-existed, as you know. Uh, in fact, one estimate is that at that time, I remember when you opened your first branch, 
uh, it was perhaps five or six thousand crores is the estimated value of the GDP of the RRV since you mentioned GDP. Uh, it took the GDP had to go from zero to six thousand crores before the first bank branch opened in the RRV. So John Robinson had said in the 1920s, finance follows enterprise. Exactly the opposite view was uh, proclaimed or postulated by uh, Mr. Joseph Schum Schumpeter, another famous economist uh, who actually came from Eastern Europe, but he did spend time, I think, in Cambridge. He said, enterprise follows finance. That is, if you do financial development, if you do financial sector deepening, if you not just open bank branches, if you have financial sector uh, innovations and reforms, then when you deepen financial sector, that helps economic activity. So if you look at that philosophy, you look at 1991 onwards, is it true that when India undertook major financial sector deregulation, for example, you don't need any permission for opening new branches. I don't know what the situation is now, but the spirit of it is that interest rates were deregulated, branch opening policies were deregulated, foreign banking you know, activities were deregulated. We have deregulation of uh, outbound remittances. We have de uh, substantial liberalization of those NRE, NRO accounts. We have a lot of banking sector deregulation. You know? So is it that the banking sector and financial sector deregulation and reforms have led to economic growth that we saw from 1991 onwards till today, despite the pandemic, despite COVID, despite the 2008-9 crisis and so on, our growth has been 7%, 7.5 around that. So growth rate has substantially jumped up for India, average growth rate I'm saying. So over, a, over this 30 year period, it has actually grown at, uh, we are now four or five times bigger. Of, of course, economic reforms of, were not just in the financial sector, we had industrial delicensing. License Raj, you know, one of the biggest things was dismantling of license Raj. Matlab, you don't need a permission to expand your factory. Then many other reforms. So the point, I, question I'm trying to ask you, Dharavi, it took time for your first branch to come. But this counter example is that, is it true that because financial sector was opened up, economic, economic growth in India took off? So I have given you two opposing views. Joan Robinson says, finance follows enterprise. Finance is the handmaiden of enterprise. Finance is the hand, economic development first, financial sector development next. Schumpeter says, Economic growth follows from financial reforms. When you have financial deepening, then you have more economic growth. Because what, what does deepening mean? Credit markets develop. It's easier to get a loan. You know, I know that a uh, lot of the people in this audience, especially those with uh, gray hair or no hair, they, for them, taking a housing loan must have been a decision they have taken much later in their life. So at the end of your working life and you're successful, you then have this dream that I'm going to take a housing loan and I'm going to have my own. Today's young generation, the moment they get their first paycheck, they go to the bank and say, give me a housing loan. They are, they are unafraid of taking on loans, whether it's a car loan, housing loan. What are they doing? They're actually borrowing money from their own future. Why is it that the older generation people uh, ha were not so, why is it that they were not so uh, bold to take a housing loan uh, much earlier in, the, in their 20s. Because, not that they were not bold or something, because such markets did not exist. The credit market, uh, which is, it was not so easy to get a housing loan. The, the credit markets were not developed, not deregulated, not liberalized. So to some extent what Schumpeter is saying seems to be making sense, that the moment these credit markets deepened, they liberalized the whole process of getting loans, uh, they liberalized in the sense that uh, the loan officers were allowed to take decisions which are bolder. We had the flourishing of housing loan markets and younger and younger people started taking loans. So it looks like when, when younger people are taking loans, that is leading to the growth of the housing industry, that is leading, leading to the growth of real estate, that leads to the growth of the cement companies, of the steel companies, of labor contractors, of then once you build a flat, then you have to have the white goods. You have to buy a fridge, you have to buy a TV, you have to buy a bed, you have to buy curtains. Some 200 industries are related to this one housing market. So it looks like deepening the financial sector, liberalizing the financial sector has led to the growth of the economy. Hey, then who is right? John Robinson or Joseph Schimpeter? 
So I must tell you that this is a great debate. Uh, it raged in 1930s and 40s. I don't think there was any clear winner. And even to this day, the debate goes on. Is finance uh, the handmaiden of enterprise? Or does enterprise, the, sorry, is finance the sort of subservient to enterprise? Or does finance lead enterprise? Now, the peak of this happened in 2008. In 2008, in America, the financial sector had gone so, has, had grown so handsomely, so handsomely, that in 2007-08, 50% of all profits of corporate America, 50% of profits of corporate America, including companies like Boeing, like GE, chem chemicals, fertilizers, pharmaceuticals, telecom, and financial sector and Wall Street. 50% of the profits were coming only from the financial sector. So financial sector, of course, that includes banking, but it includes uh, uh, capital markets. It was so profitable, it was so lucrative that the brightest kids, whether they were getting a, a PhD in, in physics or in mathematics or computer science, they were all going to Wall Street. It looked like finance was leading economy. Jobs, you know, you must have seen this, uh, all those, you know, very crazy movies like Wolf of Wall Street, where some of them are, you know, they are critical. And then you had the 2008 crisis. I mean, the, the crash. There was a solid gold-plated bank like Lehman Bank, Lehman Brothers, uh, which uh, existed perhaps for 200 years or 250 years. Overnight, just went zero. And after 2008-09, uh, all kinds of regulation came in. And now the profit ratio, which, was, which had peaked at 50%, has come down to maybe, I don't know, 20 15%. And in fact, there has been now demand from various uh, policymakers and thinkers and writers in America, let's make banking boring again. Have you heard this? That <laughs> 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 We need to go back to banking must be, become boring again, because that was excessive. And I mean, I, the, today's talk is not about the crisis of 2008. But I'm just saying, so this debate, the, 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 the debate is, uh, when we're talking about future of banking, what is the role of the financial sector? So I just wanted to spend some time on that. What is, is financial sector the most be all and end all? Or really what we care about is the economy, livelihoods, jobs, improvement of lives, the ease of living, quality of life. You know, you want to, or is it about finance? So maybe for this audience, it is a, it's a, sounds like a rhetorical question, but there is a real debate in, in, in the world of economics and, and finance literature. And as I said, it is not uh, fully settled. And, and I would say, uh, if you ask me, to me at least it makes sense that financial sector uh, comes after the economy thrives. You know, I'm, remem I'm reminded that when I used to work for AB and Ambro Bank, uh, that uh, I used to wonder, we also had this high net worth banking, you know, in commercial banks you have this. So there was, they used to rush to this place called, uh, uh, first is East Godavari district, you know, uh, Guntur, and the other one is where they make the brassware, uh, Muradabad. So Guntur and Muradabad were like the happening places, I go, Samartha, what is, what is exactly, of course now it is, I'm sure that it's obvious to you. So Muradabad is famous for brassware and exports, very massive, very, very flourishing business. And East Godavari is a, one of the richest and most fertile parts of Andhra, the then undivided Andhra. And therefore the agricultural incomes, the income from, you know, commercial uh, agriculture was very high. So the bankers used to just hang out there, they, the high net worth banking services included escorting their child to uh, their admission in London School of Economics and uh, all kinds of things. So let me not give you all the gory details. But uh, that was to me an example of how finance follows enterprise. The enterprise was flourishing and therefore financiers and bankers were going there. So it seems to me that is, the, that is what finance. Finance is a handmaiden to growth. And what does financial sector do? What does, uh, let's talk about banking, because India's financial sector is dominated by, uh, by banking. What does financial sector do? The financial sector, so again, since you mentioned, uh, let me tell you, since we talked about this black box, 
So we have this economy which consists of uh, consumers and producers. The same people can be producers in the morning. I mean, when you go and run your business, you're a producer. But in the evening, when you're eating your dinner, you're a consumer. So you have to buy your onions and potatoes and, and you know, uh, and so consumers and producers are not two different sets of people. It's a role you play. Now, what consumers do is they consume, they spend money, but they also save. So typically, when you get income, producers sell goods and services. For that, they get income. That income, as consumers, they spend. And what they don't spend is savings. Now, what happens to that savings? The, saving, the savings goes back into the system, is channelized as fresh investments. See, economic growth happens because we keep investing in the economy. Think of, I mean, very simple story is that think of a farmer. Suppose Majakad Evdi Zameen, I've got, I said, five hectares of land. And I grow corn on it, maka. And what I do is I always keep 5% of the land, that, that maize, that corn that I grow, I keep it aside. I don't eat it. I don't consume it. Baki sagra, I consume it or sell it in the market. That one, that seed I use to replant for next year. So that 10% of that corn production for me is investment for tomorrow's or next year's production. Now, what if that 10% is only 1%? No, that's not going to be sufficient. 1% is too little investment. Your next year's crop is not going to be... What if 10% is 35% or 50%? But then I won't have enough to eat if I'm going to invest all of it. So what is the golden number? In Chinese economy, the investment rate had reached 50% of GDP. The Chinese economy also grew, you know, India started its growth in 1991, Chinese economy started in 1978. They have 13 years lead. And they grew at a fantastic rate of nearly 10%. We grew at 7%, they grew at a 10% growth. So growth rate was fantastic over 30, more than 30 years because their investment rate was 50%. So, so also, you know, um, uh, India's, grow, by the way, investment rate uh, peaked at around 35 or 38%. So the thing about, uh, I was telling you that the story of an economy is consumers, producers, consumption, spending, savings, and savings goes as investment. So how much, what happens to the savings is it gets channelized as investment for tomorrow. And the financial sector, the banking people are the ones who are responsible for doing this. That is, you take savings from, from uh, consumers and you give them to producers. Uh, the savers are the depositors, people who, you know, like that Cambodian guy who did not believe that you can put money in the bank. And, and uh, the banks, now why, why do we need banks? Why don't the savers directly give money to the industrialists? Why don't they just, you know, why do you even need uh, banks in the middle? Because that intermediation cannot be done. There are the, the set of depositors or people who save is a very diverse and diffuse group. In India, Hundreds of millions of people are saving. Some people are saving 10 rupees, 20 rupees, 100 rupees, 1,000. So we, need, we have only about, what, maybe 200 banks in the country, two, 300 banks. So institutionally, and of course, your savings are not getting, getting routed only through banking. They're getting routed through other institutions now. Mutual funds are growing. Mutual funds are now handling something like 30 lakh crores worth of uh, wealth. Banks are handling 150 lakh crores, I think, uh, deposits. 200 lakh, yeah, 200 lakh, yeah. Something like 200 lakh crores is with banks, 30 lakh crores, 35 lakh crores, not a small number, is with mutual funds. Mutual funds were zero, remember, 20 years ago. They have also grown. And then, of course, there are insurance companies. So that's the role of financial sector. So coming back to what I said, the role, so when we talk about future of banking, we have to think about what is the role of the financial sector. And India is a bank-dominated financial sector. All said and done, our stock markets are growing, our insurance markets are growing, but all said and done, for most people, bank. For them, when they talk about financial sector, it is the bank. So bank dominated. The role of the banks is to simply, in an aggregate macro sense, take the savings of the country, channelize it into productive investments, and create future growth. So if India is going to grow at 7 or 8 percent for the next 10, 20 years, the role of the banks is to make sure that this channelization is happening efficiently, productively, uh, creating the minimum NPAs, Remember you said uh, NPAs are, in your case, are half a percent, but unfortunately some banks seem to be just wasting money. Uh, NPAs are high. So this is the role of the banks. Their, 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 their role is to intermediate, manje, be the middleman, middle, middle person. And in doing so, what do they do? Well, they, they give loans, right? Fundamentally, banks give loans. 
but you have to make sure that the loans are repaid. You know, I, when I was uh, heading, as you said, actually, uh, this was almost uh, 23 years ago, when I, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was given the charge of starting a new business called microfinance, that too in a foreign bank. So there the amazing thing was that uh, you give loans to this uh, bachat gut, uh, women's groups, and the repayment rate was 99 or 100 percent, with no collateral. Even today. So I was to want, I mean, this, I know this is a very learned audience, so all these puzzle questions, I'm not able to get my punchline because everybody knows the answer. But in those days, at least people, <laughs> people didn't know the answer. How is it possible that you're giving loans, no collateral, and uh, repayment rate is, I mean, they are so ethical and all that, you know, they're, you know, repaying loans is like, not repaying is a sin, they don't commit sin. I thought, I mean, of course, everybody is ethical that way. The, the secret was the following, that first of all, these loans were like 10,000 rupees, 20,000 rupees. The repayment was every week. So weekly repayment of 50 rupees or 100 rupees every week. And the loan was given to not one person, but a group of five women or seven women. And the liability of repayment was not on that one person, but the entire, it's called joint liability. If there is some one, if you miss one repayment, if you, if you default on one loan, then the entire five people is, gets blacklisted. And then they don't, they are not eligible for a repeat loan. So the, uh, the, the real secret is that these women from very low income background, they, for them getting a loan is a very survival thing. It's not like a loan for setting up a big factory. They actually, the, these loans are helping them uh, the, on their day-to-day -day capital, you know, working capital, like maybe feeding the cow or, you know, if you're running some, some milk business. And for them, the repeat loan is very important. It's not this one-time loan. Hamari has the loan you know, some strange countries that we don't even didn't even know existed. So for them the repeat loan is important. And the repeat loan is in jeopardy if you default. So the enforcement of repayment rate is not the collateral, but is the fact that you will lose your access to capital or your access to bank. So that a repeat loan hawa sale, then you have to keep repaying at a hundred percent rate. And that was a secret. It's a great insight. So this is, you know, the, the, for future of banking, this is, I think, uh, I mean, now, of course, the microfinance industry, in fact, what happened is because this repeat loan uh, is important and because the joint liability means all other uh, people are sharing the liability, unfortunately, some unhealthy things started happening, coercive re repayment. Sometimes what happens is if this woman is, is in trouble, her friends, teacher, Maitrini, you know, we'll, we'll repay, the, yeah, yeah, for this week's installment, we'll pay on your behalf, don't worry, you know. But this is the sort of friendly way, but slowly, slowly, there, there used to be coercive, so incidents of coercion. Then, of course, then uh, it, it became highly politicized. As you know, if in 2009, the whole thing exploded in Andhra Pradesh. One third of the microfinance industry was in Andhra Pradesh, and the moment it got politicized, it led to the almost virtual breakdown of the entire system. Because what is happening is the repayment cycle, the 100% access, and their wonderful growth uh, was happening at a rate which was cost efficient, where the rate of interest was about 20%. And then uh, the politicians said, hey, what is it? There are two crore of, uh, borrowers, beneficiaries. I mean, this is not, we are going to, this 24% is usurious. This is loot, they're looting the, you should make the interest rate uh, capped at 9%. Was khatam. That was, you know, then, then it became politicized and the whole thing broke down. Thankfully, the whole industry has revived again. But the great basic insight is this, that for repayment, bank profitability, you don't need collateral. So the future of, so I, I, that was one, one story I wanted to say. The other thing I wanted to say was uh, around the same time, I remember a lot of bank branches were opening up. They started concept of evening banking. You know, we were coming from an era where banks used to close, but when you go at 2 o'clock, it's over. <laughs> then tokens, and if you wanted DD that day or demand draft, you know, I, I remember one of my relatives, he said, I worked hard today. You know, I, I wrote eight, I, eight DDs today. <laughs> Ask me, eight DDs. <laughs> I was thinking, what is this work where producing eight DDs is like very hard work. So uh, around that time, all these new innovations were coming, were evening banking. Then to keep people, sort of customers, uh, little engaged or interested, they started opening a cafe. 
So there was a coffee, uh, coffee counter in the bank branch. And then they started having a little lounge for high net worth banker, you know, uh, customers. Then maybe some books. And they started, this early days, so there was an internet browser there. And at the same time, in other countries, and it's coming to India also, when you went to a supermarket, a mall, they started having ATM kiosks there. You could do some FD opening and closing. I'm talking about 20 years ago, okay? So the, the future of banking had already started. The banks were becoming cafes and retail outlets, and retail you know, chains and malls were becoming banks. So this merger had you know, this kind of mix. What is it? You know, am I going to a bank or a mall? Or is it a mall or a bank? So this had already started, but now we are clearly seeing that, that uh, the future of banking, let me say, uh, uh, the one, uh, sorry, I also want to mention one more thing which is more recent, is the entry of people like Google or Tencent in China. So Google Pay, now uh, you hardly ever have to go to a bank. I mean, all the payment is taken care of by such, you know, uh, fin fintech. By the way, fintech companies, I'm told, in the last three, four years, uh, have gone from a, f a few, you know, just a few dozen to hundreds of fintech companies. And they, uh, sorry, I'm talking about unicorns. There are some hundreds of unicorns now in fintech. So uh, Google is just an example where uh, Google Pay has become ubiquitous. I mean, uh, so, and Tencent, this payment, so payment mechanisms also, uh, they are serious competition. They are not a bank. Another example in India is Bajaj Finance. I want, I want to take a name just as an example. Oh, who, what is it? They have what, Kitty, 40 lakh customer borrowers? <laughs> He's keeping track of the competition, as you can see. <laughs> so, uh, how does, how, where a Bajaj Finance, what is it? How can it be a bank? No, well, you go to a Vijay Sales, you go to a shop, you say, ah, hey, this microwave, I like it. I don't have money, I'll No, 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 don't come tomorrow. Take this form, just sign it. Just two signatures, that's done. You don't know, before you walk out, you have become a borrower of Bajaj Finance. Very easy terms and all that. And their NPA ratio is also low, but they don't, it's a, it's, I would say it's one of the biggest banks in India, which is not a bank. And this is, same thing happened to GE Capital back in 2000, not 8, but uh, 2001 and so on. It was the biggest bank in the world, which was not a bank, GE Capital. Because they were specialists in this, whatever, you know, the, uh, what financing is it called, refinancing and so on. So this, this kind of mergers of banks, uh, people who are operating linked banks, but they, they're not, they don't really have a banking license as such. They're not regulated entities. I think Bajaj Finance is of course regulated because it's treated as an NBFC, uh, but the regulation is different for NBFCs than for banks like yours. So this, uh, these are examples of trends in banking. So if, you, if I look at future of banking, now we come to future of banking and just very quickly conclude. The future of banking in one line is that it is nothing but CRM, Customer Relationship Management. Because it is not about uh, giving loans for a collateral, monitoring the loan, you know, all that. It is, it's, uh, now you will have, you increasingly are going to give loans based on non-collateral. That is, you will be giving them based on cash flows. Banks, are, there are already fintech in India which are giving loans based on your Facebook profile. You know, there are all these AI tools which are crawling the web and keeping a track of everything you do. Oh, he went to Kerala for a holiday on that Saturday, Sunday, and he's supposed to be... So all that is just picked up by algorithms. So uh, trawling your social media and internet presence, uh, keeping track of your cash flows, uh, I said, you, th you said Sybil scores, credit rating agencies getting into now your uh, credit rating of individuals, retail. So ba basically a bank, uh, so first thing I'd like to say is that it's nothing but a very com complex customer relationship management. And customers are both, by the way, both depositors as well as borrowers. Secondly, uh, uh, the future of banking, and uh, I, I don't know when we will get there, but it, the trend is very clear. Second, the so first thing is it's, it's, not, it's not just a department like credit writing and deposits, and it's customer relationship management. Second uh, is this emergence of super app. Now TCS, I think Tata's are doing a super app, many companies are doing a super app, maybe Reliance is doing that. I think banks will be, the, the future bank is going to be like a super app. So it is, it is not just an app, sorry, it is not an app, but it is something which will be on your mobile. So uh, when I'm going, it, it will already, if I'm at Starbucks, it will always already tell them, ki, what is my preferred coffee flavor? 
uh, or it will alert me that some, some insurance pre premium is due or your housing society ka the annual monthly maintenance charge is due or they may, if you have authorized it, it will already make that payment or it will make decisions about my wealth management. You know, your portfolio is now, there's a little more risk on, so you should shift to balanced funds, you know, change the portfolio, make it more liquid funds. So this will all be done by, uh, and this, the bank which gets this app, you know, more and more sophisticated, that's the way it's going to go. So the, that's the second trend. The, the one, one trend is CRM, the other trend is the emergence of apps and super apps. I know it sounds like a holy grail and this, you know, this, uh, you must have read about this, uh, uh, how somebody makes a phone call, can I order a pizza? No, sir, your record shows that you're a heart patient. Hurry, what did you do? So, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, that is a caricature, but actually a banks can be, and why, I, why am I saying that banks are in the best uh, position to do this? Because for you, the raw material is data. Since your engagement, uh, customer engagement is so deep that you will be actually be in the best position to do a very sophisticated job of this super app. Uh, it won't be easy. It, there will be a lot of use of AI. I will tell you uh, uh, that uh, not now, but five, six years ago, I had this experience. I have a Gmail account and they were, it was stuck for some reason. So, and in Gmail, there is nothing, you know, if whom do you, there's no number, there's no one attend number, no, no, no uh, customer service number, nothing. So you just, I just sent an email, there's some, and then I got a response, instant response. Yeah, what is the problem? Then I explained the problem. Okay, then can you, have you tried this, 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 then do this, do this. this. Within 15 minutes, the whole thing got solved. It didn't strike me, but later I realized that I was actually, I had interacted with a robot. I had interacted with what is now called, what are they called? Chat. Chat. Chatbot, chatbot, yeah. But this was five, six years ago. And it was such a seamless and pleasant experience. And it, the person that, whatever, it's what you call it, was so pleasant. They had a name also, I think, Gayatri, Nancy or somebody. And uh, I said, because all of you are friends with Alex, I hope. <laughs> Alexa can also do some fund management for you, by the way. But <laughs> so, uh, so this is, I think, the second trend in uh, uh, banking. So C uh, CRM is one big area and CRM also will uh, thrive on data. Second is this super app. The third thing I want to mention uh, sort of is about digital currencies. That uh, uh, India has also introduced central bank digital currency. What is that? It is nothing but uh, instead of handling cash or m money in my checking or banking uh, savings account, it will, it will now reside in the, uh, in the central bank, Manje Reserve Bank. So if I go and do transactions, see when I do GPay, when I say GPay, what is GPay doing? GPay is connecting to my bank account, real bank account, and transferring it from that bank account to the recipient's bank account. So this GPay is the, is the they are not re replacing my bank account. That will change. With central bank digital currency, you're actually eliminating, uh, it's not just a payment mechanism, actually you're eliminating the need to have a, a separate savings or checking account with a bank like Saraswat Bank. So that is a trend which you need to be aware of. So uh, of course there will be a backlash because the banking lobby is very strong. <laughs> and they'll say Ki, this invites white collar crime and this invites hacking and cyber crime. So are we ready? Do we have enough safety measures and do we have enough, uh, you know, uh, security measures and so on? The, so that's, a, of course, legitimate concerns. And uh, in fact, a country like Singapore, after embarking on CBDC, central bank digital currency, they have actually backed off. They have stopped it. Now, we don't know whether it is, what is the reason, but, but some, country, some countries are going ahead. China's experiment is expanding and India has already uh, started. So I feel this is another trend you need to be aware of that people may not need to have banking accounts. At least depositors will not need to have any account with banks. So then what will banks do? So banks will, of course, be in the business of lending. Banks will also have to, will, of course, be, you know, capital requirement. Remember, uh, when I said GDP needs labor and capital. So capital requirement is always there. The person who buys wholesale vegetables from New, New Manavi, Mumbai, and sells it in Parel, they need those 500 rupees daily working capital because they pay 500 rupees and bring it here and return that money for five rupees or whatever, 10 rupees more. So they return 510 rupees. But without that 500 rupees, the bhandwal or capital business is not possible. So, so GDP growth, economic activity will need capital, we need, will need credit, will need loans. 
that central bank is not going to give. CBDC is not going to take care of that. So the banks have to exist, but they will have to think about how they are going to make these loans. What is the source of funds? Are they going to resort, are they have to become wholesale, uh, you know, do, do they have to resort to wholesale uh, sources? Or uh, do they have to attract depositors with some other, you know, uh, schemes or uh, offer interest rates higher than the central bank? I don't know. So that, uh, the, the, the future is certainly more customer relationship management uh, expertise and sophistication. Secondly, uh, app, uh, the super app, I, I don't know what, is, uh, for want of a better word, I'm just using the word super app, but this is that uh, the bank which can get a personal assistant to you, all your customers will win. And the third is, of course, the emergence of uh, uh, digital currency. Deliberately, I'm not using words like cryptocurrency because crypto assets, they should be not called currency, they are called crypto assets. And crypto assets are nothing but assets where people park their money uh, because it is beyond, it is sort of ba based on block ledger, blockchain technology. And like you invest in a stock or a, or a real estate, you invest in crypto assets and they go up and down and so on, but they need to be funded by real money. So I'm not talking about that. That's more in the area of wealth management. What I'm talking about is the central bank issued digital currency. And there is, there is I don't think there is any chance that uh, privately issued uh, digital currency is going to uh, succeed. Because on that, though, definitely all the regulators will come down with a big whack. They will not allow them to exist. In fact, already in the last budget, you know, they have introduced all kinds of measures to discourage that. So this crypto assets will exist. They will be there for speculative investments or, you know, investments which want to, which want to perhaps uh, hide from the tax, uh, tax man. But central bank issued digital currency is something that if it really takes off, I feel that banks will have to uh, reckon with that. So future of banking will have to think about how they will uh, deal with uh, the, this, uh, this trend. So these three uh, I wanted to mention. And um, uh, I will just conclude with a few thoughts uh, which beyond this uh, topic. One is that uh, I believe that uh, Cooperative banks have a very, very important uh, role to play in an economy like ours, and the success of Saraswat Bank is extremely important. I say that because, uh, as you know, a cooperative bank cannot access unlimited capital. So cooperative bank, uh, unlike the big company in the newspapers these days, your bank cannot uh, increase uh, by three times in two years, or your market cap cannot <laughs> increase by 100 times, by design. Because capital, that is a feature or flaw, you can say, you can call it a feature or flaw, but cooperative banks can grow only at the rate at which you are generating a surplus. And that is limited by your capital adequacy ratio. And that capital depends on your own members. So, so your growth is slower, but it is more stable and more higher quality. But it's very important because, as I said, everybody can become a member. It's truly democratic functioning. And, and if you grow like this, your success like this will keep uh, political, uh, you know, pressures of political interference much lower. I think that's very important for the success. And the, the success comes from the fact that it's truly participative, inclusive, and democratic. So please, that is important. Secondly, about uh, inequality, since you mentioned that one of the big factors in Indian society today is that inequality is increasing. I must mention this, uh, even though it's really uh, only indirectly related to the concept of future of banking. The inequality is increasing in terms of income. Inequality is increasing much more in terms of wealth. Wealth is nothing but accumulated income. So, pidan pidate vadadada. Inequality is increasing in terms of access to good quality education and healthcare. Inequality is, ex uh, is increasing in terms of uh, now, digital literacy, you know, some of us are very comfortable with Google Pay. Can you imagine people who are not comfortable, who, you know, who, who are still... So, digital literacy is increasing the divide. So, Vishamata and Vadatali, it is increasing inequality in the digital... As our economy turns more digital, digital literacy is creating a divide unless we are inclusive about this. So, if you have a digital 
transformation project, you have to ensure that everybody... So what happens when, when inequality is increasing, what, are the, what is the role of a corporate bank? You have to consciously be more inclusive. You have to be consciously uh, focused on... There are people who still today don't, cannot access financial services. I mentioned the, the fellow in Cambodia, but in India also, even though we talk about uh, Jandan Yojana, JDY was just opening bank accounts, but how much of them are really active? How many people are actually using financial services? How many people are getting access to uh, credit? You will be surprised to know that even today, 40 or 50 percent of the farmers have no access to any credit. 50 percent of the farmers don't have access to any formal credit. This is the, this is the case. And, and SMEs, there are 63.5 million uh, uh, SMEs, small and medium enterprises, 63.5 million, 64 crores. Uh, uh, SMEs are the ones which generate employment, output, exports, but do they have access to credit? Very little, not even 10 percent, I think. Despite we have SME, MSME law, we have an MSME ministry, we have MSME uh, reports from RBI, we had the UK Sina committee and so many committees, not UK Sina, I think, uh, maybe UK. There are many committees, and but still the the the. So I'm saying that uh, when I talk about inequality, it's inequality in terms of income, wealth, digital access, uh, uh, healthcare, but also from a banking perspective, access to you know, financial services. I am mentioning financial services, not just loans. It's not just access to loans. It's financial services. So when you talk about future of banking, while it's one one side is very fantastic, data oriented, data mining oriented, CRM. Uh, technology and AI oriented super app and central bank digital currency. This is the future. But let's not forget that if inequality just keeps increasing, the whole edifice might blow up, you know. We have to be conscious of that. So on that note again, I'll, I thank you for inviting me for this lecture and uh, I thank you for your patience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ranade. Uh, uh, are there any questions for him? Uh, he would like to take a few. Sir, I had a question about digital currency. In fact, when the RBI was very vocal, about not uh, encouraging cryptocurrency because basically there are no underlying assets. It is, I think, one of the first central bankers, apart from the developed economies, to go for the digital currency. I cannot claim that I know everything about it, but whatever little I know, I think there is no paper trail of transaction. And in our economy, where despite demonetization, uh, there is a substantial parallel economy, and anti-money laundering laws. How these two things will work together? So, so Madam, you remember Ray Raymond bonus stamps? So Raymond bonus stamps, if you, if you guys remember, there used to be little stamps that we had to collect. So if you purchase what goods worth 100 rupees, you got a Raymond bonus stamp. Then you have to put them in your uh, sticker. You know, the, you, once you have 100 Raymond bonus stamps, you go and exchange it for a coffee maker or something. So then what, at some point what happened is that they, the Raymond bonus time itself became currency. So you could go and buy toothpaste for this. <laughs> I mean, it's in a lighter way. So central bank digital currency is nothing but tokens. So the tokens are such that uh, uh, when I transfer money to you, there is a debit and credit entry in respective accounts in the central bank. So you are asking, unlike a physical paper note, which has no trail, this thing will have a trail by definition. Okay. It will always have a trail. But the, because of that, a uh, lot of people said are concerned about privacy issues. So the, uh, the governor of the Reserve Bank, he, he made a statement saying, no, no, I'm assuring you that we'll take care of privacy. But in my mind, that assurance is not good enough. I was not convinced that, uh, so unlike paper-based currency, the digital central bank issued digital currency there will be a digital trail and you have to assume that there is zero privacy. That may be one reason why it may not take off fully, but uh, that's a separate, well, we, that's what we thought about Aadhaar, but Aadhaar has taken off. So. Now, nowadays, somebody told me you need Aadhaar number for even opening a Netflix account. 
Any other questions? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajit Ranade, for your absolutely engaging, editing, and enlightening uh, speech on the topic of, uh, of future of banking. I am sure uh, mo most of us are bankers or related to the financial field. So all of us have been enriched with the feast of thoughts and facts and perspectives shared by you. Undoubtedly, you are one of the most thought leader and intellectuals of the country today. We thank you, sir, for sparing your valuable time and coming all the way from Pune and sharing your thoughts with us, memories of which will remain with us for long. Thank you, sir. I would also like to place my sincere thanks to the esteemed audience who have graced this occasion today by sparing their valuable time. Last but not the least, I thank the management of Nehru Centers for the excellent arrangement.